Some jawless vertebrates, or agnathids, ultimately gave rise to nathostomes, or jawed vertebrates. The jaws of nathostomes enabled them to grasp and slice their prey item, allowing these organisms to consume food items much larger than the size of their mouths. This greatly increased the number of food items that these organisms could consume. In addition, nathostomes also evolved two pairs of fins or paired appendages. This allowed these organisms to be much more agile while chasing their prey, making them much more efficient predators. As a result of the evolution of the jaws and these two pairs of paired appendages, nathostomes ultimately outcompete most agnathids for food. Therefore, nathostomes represent the majority of all vertebrates in existence today. To understand how jaws developed in the nathostomes, we have to take a look at the gills of modern fish. Composed of a series of gill arches seen here and here, to which are attached thousands of delicate finger-like gill filaments which exchange gases with the surrounding water. Evidence strongly suggests that it is the modification of some gill arches in the ancestors of the nathostomes that led to the evolution of jaws. Based on fossil evidence, gill arches in the ancestors of the nathostomes start to become fused to one another, ultimately giving rise to the upper and the lower jaw. Other gill arches begin to migrate towards the front of the head to offer support. These fused gill arches, or jaws, later become equipped with teeth which are believed to have evolved from modified scales. As we can see here, the majority of all vertebrates are nathostomes, and the majority of these nathostomes are most likely fish. And one of the major groups of nathostome fish are represented by what are often referred to as the chondrichthys, or cartilaginous fishes, represented mainly by sharks, skates, and rays. Their nutrition is mostly carnivorous, and the largest representatives of this group, such as the whale shark, are in fact filter or suspension feeders. The second major group of nathostome fish are represented by what is often referred to as the osteichthys, or the bony fish. These represent the majority of all fish. Osteichthys, or bony fish, have gills that are covered by a flap known as an operculum. They also, unlike sharks, skates, and rays, have what is known as a swim bladder or an air sac that allows them to regulate their position in the water column by either inflating or deflating this pouch thereby changing its density relative to the surrounding water. Being the largest group of fish, the osteichthys can be further subdivided into the ray-finned and the lobe-finned fishes. With regards to the ray-finned fishes, they are the most numerous of all fish, and they are so named because their fins are supported by long, bony, flexible rays. In contrast to ray fin fish, lobed fin fish, like the lung fish, or the coelacanth, have fins that are not supported by long, flexible, bony rays, but rather by bones and muscles. 
and it is from these fish that the first terrestrial animals evolved. See here in the coelocanth, the fins of lobe fin fishes contain bones and muscles that are homologous to those in other terrestrial animals, therefore suggesting a distant common ancestry. And it is these types of fins that most likely allowed the ancestors of the earliest animals descended from the lobe fin fish to support themselves on land or within the shallows. Of all the lobe fin fishes, the lungfish has been identified based on anatomical and genetic evidence as the closest living relative of tetrapods, which are terrestrial animals that possess two pairs of paired appendages, such as arms and legs. Fish possesses a swim bladder that allows it to take gulps of air, which will then subsequently diffuse into its bloodstream. This generally occurs at times when the water becomes stagnant and very oxygen poor. Ultimately, this swim bladder of the lungfish evolved into the lungs of terrestrial tetrapods. As previously mentioned, tetrapods include any four-legged land vertebrate or vertebrates that possess two pairs of paired appendages. Examples of tetrapods include amphibians, reptiles, birds, and of course mammals. Based on anatomical and genetic evidence, tetrapods most likely descended from lobed fin fish somewhere around 700 million years ago. And of course, lungfish are the closest living relatives to all modern tetrapods. Among the tetrapods, various reproductive strategies evolved. Our strategists include tetrapod animals that live in mostly unstable environments, which would favor rapid reproduction. These animals also produce many offspring, primarily because they tend to invest little to no parental care. Therefore, very few of the offspring ever survive to adulthood. These individuals also are relatively small, and reach sexual maturity rather quickly. Examples of our strategists include fish, amphibians, insects, and even some small rodents. Contrast to our strategists, certain other tetrapods are referred to as case strategists. These organisms tend to live in more stable environments and therefore don't need to reach reproductive age nearly as quickly. As a result, they produce very few offspring because they invest a lot of parental care. So therefore, offspring do tend to survive more often to adulthood. Examples of case strategists include birds and reptiles and larger mammals. Here we can see various survivorship curves for both K and R strategists, with the number of survivors plotted along the y-axis and the average lifespan along the x.
As we can see, case strategists that are often regarded as being type 1 exhibit a very high survival rate as newborns due to a great deal of parental care. And it's only at old age that more individuals begin to die off. Examples of a type 1 case strategist would be any large mammal, such as humans, elephants, bears, so on and so forth. In contrast to a type 1 case strategist, in which the older individuals die at the highest rate in the population, a type 2 case strategist, such as many songbirds, exhibit a relatively equal death rate or mortality rate at any age within the population. Our strategists are represented by a type 3 survivorship curve which illustrates a very high mortality rate as offspring. This is due primarily to little parental care. As a result, a higher percentage of this population will be represented by older individuals. These are the ones that will be surviving at the highest rate. Examples of our strategists, once again, would be fish, amphibians, insects, they would be represented by this type 3 survivorship curve. All tetrapods are also considered to be amniotes because of the type of egg that they produce. One of the most significant features of the amniotic egg is, of course, the shell, which is solid in bird eggs, but leathery in reptile eggs. It is the shell that enabled for the establishment of a watery environment within which the embryo can develop without drying out or desiccating. This was a major, major adaptation that enabled our tetrapod ancestors to successfully invade terrestrial environments. In mammals, this shell is absent. And this is due to the fact that all mammals practice internal development and therefore the shell would not be necessary. Surrounding the developing embryo, shown here, are a series of extra embryonic membranes that surround and support the embryo throughout its development. These extra embryonic membranes is the amnion. The amnion immediately surrounds the developing embryo and is actually filled with amniotic fluid. This fluid surrounds, cushions, and protects the embryo from any mechanical stress that may be applied to it during its development. We have the allantois. The allantois is adapted for collecting metabolic waste produced by the embryo during its development. The chorion is adapted for the exchange of gases. These gases do initially diffuse into the egg through the shell, which is semi-permeable to atmospheric gases. Finally, the yolk sac, in most amniotic eggs, is adapted for storing nutrients, which pass directly into the developing embryo. In human eggs, however, the yolk sac has been modified not for delivering nutrients into the embryo, which is accomplished by way of the placenta and the umbilical cord, but rather the yolk sac has been adapted for the development of blood cells.